Howdy, uh, Shasta College, Humanities 2. We're doing film studies this week. I'm going to cram a lot of stuff in because film and cinema is very complicated and involved, and we're still very much a part of who we are as a culture. Now it's all on HBO or Netflix or whatever. That's the new cinema. Um, how many of you actually go to movie theaters? Uh, since the pandemic, fewer and fewer people go to movie theaters, and movies are not not uh, released that much in movie theaters. Um, the habit of going to the movie is, has been broken um, because of the pandemic and other things. And so now you're watching everything on a screen in your house uh, without an audience. And they were made to be collectively enjoyed with an audience. Uh, if you ever go to a comedy movie um, with a crowd that appreciates what's going on, it helps to laugh together. Horror movie, it helps to be scared together. Sci-fi, thriller, it helps to be involved in the collective mindset of the audience. It's like going to a concert or music. Um, it's, it's more enjoyable when it's in the collective. All I do is watch things on a screen now because I'm antisocial and I don't like the movies in Reading anyway. They're always the newest blockbuster, uh, the newest Top Gun or whatever. I don't want to see Tom Cruise running around without his shirt on. And so the art films that I go to, the foreign films, I have to usually go to San Francisco or up to Ashland when I'm in Portland. Then I go to the movie theaters. Um Because I still like the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the culture impact uh, sitting with a bunch of strangers in a theater eating popcorn, and I go to a place in Portland uh, that actually can have a beer <laughs> um, and watch the film or pizza pizza. If you ever get to Portland, it's called the Lower Theater, great retro house. Uh, they show new films. They won't show Top Gun, but they'll show the coolest art films. Or what's going coming out? When I say art films, I'm not talking about Hollywood films. I'm talking about uh, foreign language films or uh, indie films that are coming up. Asian films, films from all over the world. Okay, so what I want to get into right now uh, is to make sure you guys are seeing all the assignments. I've posted everything. The final essay is due. It's not due yet, but I put the due date on there. It's all due next week. The last week is next week. I put the um, final research paper and the due date. I put the I put the subjects to look at. You got to look at the assignments. Uh, there's a discussion right now going on about the sci old silent film from 1902. I ask you to look at Trip to the Moon, and there's been some nice. It's very few of you have seen it yet, but uh, there's been some nice observations on that weird little movie. I'm, I can't help but pipe in because uh, it's a strange, strange film. The first sci-fi film ever made. Uh, and uh, when they actually thought going to the moon, you'd go up there and uh, not have any problem breathing or walking around. Um, anyway. Things have changed. I'm going to post the last thing. I'm going to post it today. You can hand in your journals, not until next week, but I'll post it so you'll see it. It's going to be in assignments. It, it'll be open, and you can post it next week. I want you guys to post the last week uh, so you, you can finish the course. If you post early without finishing the course, you'll lose a couple points. Um, next week, we're going to do television for a couple days. How we're all obsessed with binge watching Game of Thrones or uh, Only Murders in the Building or reruns of your favorite TV shows because they're rerunning everything everywhere from Mulu to Netflix to Disney Plus. What do you have? Talk about that next week. Um, 
right now in the history of films were I stopped in 1939 the other day, uh, which was the bumper crop of the year, the biggest year Hollywood ever had, has had, uh, with groundbreaking movies in color, some of them, Gone with the Winds in color, half of Wizard of Oz is in color, so they're all not black and white. We're way into sound now. Uh, that's been perfected. Now there's tons of uh, movies coming out, Weathering Heights, some of the best movies Hollywood ever produced came out in 1939. Give you uh, the output of some of these filmmakers, like a director like John Ford. In, in 1939, he directed three very major films, three films in one year. It was a an industry. That's why they called it that, a studio system. One movie after another, like building a car. Uh, and they cranked it out because the audience couldn't get enough the public paying people uh the depression's over people are feeling pretty good but something's horrible happening in europe hitler and his mob are starting to bomb england and take over poland and they want to invade other countries and they want the british want our help but we won't help them because our congress says no more no war and in those days, the president didn't have the uh, the power just to say, yes, we're going to war. Um, th they still don't, by the way, uh, but they do have the power, seems like, to invade wherever they want uh, without Congress's approval. That's another story. So we're coming out of the Depression. People are feeling good about themselves. The movies are changing. They're very adult theme. Uh, they're getting more complicated. They're just not simply entertainment. It's um, the 1940s saw Citizen Kane, which was a revolutionary film. Um, I'll post some of these uh, uh, documentaries. Hopefully, you guys are watching them on uh, you'll see it on Canvas. Uh, Orson Welles directed Citizen Kane, and it changed. It was a game changer because nobody ever seen camera work like that, or a script like that, uh, or not much else. Orson Welles was a very young man when he did that movie, and he's only 25, and he he is the actor in it, he plays Charles Emerson uh, Kane, and um, and he goes from a young man to an old man, as all do the rest of the actors who were inexperienced theatrical actors, and they're part of Mercury Theater in New York. Charles. Uh, Orson Welles' theatrical company, he hired all his friends to make this very complicated movie about a, a newspaper uh, mogul who, um, a rich kid who never does find the love he desires. It's based on the life of Randolph Hearst the huge publisher from San Francisco uh, who hated this movie so bad, he set out to destroy it and wouldn't allow, he owned 50, 60 newspapers across the country. This is long before the internet, folk. That's how we got our information were newspapers. And he didn't want it out there, so he he killed it, essentially. Uh, and then, and then, world, and then the Japanese... Bomb Pearl Harbor and game on. We're in a world war now. Later on, the French rediscovered Citizen Kane in the 50s and they started writing about it as this auteur film, meaning author, uh, has its personal stamp that, like no other Hollywood film had at that time, um, although there were some auteur filmmakers of the day, uh, like uh, John Ford, Howard Hawks, Alfred Hitchcock, they were working within the studio system, but they had a personal stamp. Their films, you could tell it was their film. They had a visual stamp, uh, how they, to tell a story, the, fo the focus on the story, we're, we're told. Like I mentioned, John Ford in one year directed three movies. He directed the, the groundbreaking Western Stagecoach, one of the first, Movies that stars John Wayne, 
um, who became huge star after that movie. And it's a very adult Western. And what I mean by adult, um, the themes are adult. It's about prejudice and revenge and love and death and loss and alcoholism and the whole gamut of these passengers on a stagecoach going through hostile uh, Indian country. Um, the Indians aren't treated well in this movie at all. Um, so, he also went, directed that year, Young Mr. Lincoln, about young Abraham Lincoln before he was president with Henry Fonda, and another Henry Fonda movie he directed called Drums Along the Mohawk with Claude Colbert. He directed those three huge epic movies all in one year. They could do that in those days because on this soundstage, they're filming one movie and they're preparing the next soundstage to do the next movie and another soundstage to do the next movie. The crews are working 24 hours a day. It is up and running and it's hopping in Hollywood. And very few of these films are filmed on location, although John Ford loves to go to Monument Valley and shoot when he can. Um, three and one year, folks. Uh, Ford is one of the people you can write about on your, um, your, your paper, your next essay, if you choose. Uh, he lived until 1971 or th so and directed some of the most incredible movies of the, of the film history. I started directing movies in the silent era. Anyway, um, so now we're in World War II, and what do we do? Well, we've got to get the war machine going. We don't have much of an army. We've been invaded by Japan. Germany has declared war on us. Uh, we, we're going to war now. And uh, Britain's happy, but we don't have much of an army or military supplies. And so we have to crank up the military machine fast. And how we do that is through war bonds, not waiting for taxes to be paid. You bought a war bond for $5, $20, $25. And where did you buy them at? Movie theaters. You'd go to a movie theater, buy your ticket, and buy a war bond. And it was worth $25. If you saved it, you could get, it, that money went directly for the war machine to build machinery, weapons, planes, boats, tanks, everything. They established a draft to get the men in the army because we needed men to go fight. And women were given jobs in the male-dominated workforce. They were building the boats, the kinks, the, art, the weapons, the machine guns, the bullets, because the men were now going into the army. And there was a, a lack of a male workforce. And women took over traditional jobs held by men. There was a popular poster to get women to sign up for these jobs in big cities like LA and San Francisco and New York, where this these things were being built. And she was called Rosie the Riveter. And it's, it got women into the workforce. It got them out of the house. They were no longer content with being housewives. That Women went to war by helping build the machinery of war. Within a year, we were pushing back on Japan, fighting back. We we're starting to fight Hitler in Europe. And we started in Africa, went to Italy. We were losing in the beginning. Japan was winning the war in the Pacific. They had too much and they were savage fighters. It took us a year or two to start getting payback in the Pacific and then it was hell on earth. And, um, and so the movies they were producing in Hollywood were propaganda films to help the war effort. War films, not all war films, there's romantic films and musicals are still being produced and westerns, but 
the war film, John Wayne, starring John Wayne or Van Johnson, uh, actors who didn't go to war uh, or volunteer for the army, they uh, they serve their country by starring in these war films as heroic characters. The, and in most of these films, uh, the U.S. came off as heroes, that we weren't bad, we weren't the Germans, we weren't the Japanese. But, folks, we were. We did some bad shit. Yes, we didn't start it, but we finished it. And, but in these war movies, you would never see that. So, a movie would come out, <coughs> propaganda film, showing how great we're doing, and the war bonds would be sold by the millions. Movie stars went out and collected money. They had the war bond drives, and movie stars would show up, and thousands of their fans would show up and buy war bonds. Millions of dollars a day to support the war machine. The whole country was behind it. It was probably the last time in this, my, in our history that the whole country, for the most part, the greatest generation, they call it, that was behind the war effort. And Hollywood fed the war machine by making lots of entertaining movies so people could go to movies, forget about the war for a few minutes, and support the war. We defeated Hitler after the D-Day invasion. Hitler ended up killing himself like the piece of crap he was and his wife he just married. And all the people down in the bunker, they all took poison. And we're talking the major war criminals of the day, the Nazis. And they killed their whole, all their families. One of them, I don't know, I can't remember which one, had eight children. And they poisoned them all because they didn't want them to be captured by the evil Western allies. The war continued in Europe for a while, even after Hitler was dead. And the Jap Japanese were not willing to give up. We were losing lots and thousands of guys a day. We were bombing, carpet bombing all of Tokyo, uh, flattening it, fire bombing. They called it most of Tokyo and major cities in Japan were made uh, uh, out of wood, their buildings, and so they burned easily. And we carpet bombed them and burned those cities down. The Japanese still weren't willing to give up. And so we said we we're going to drop a new invention on you, an atomic bomb. They still wouldn't give up. And so we dropped one. And then we dropped a second one. And within a couple of days, 100,000 people vaporized. The Japanese lost the will to fight, and it was over at a horrible, horrible cost for everybody. We came out of World War II, things have changed, big time. The directors who went to fight in World War II and the actors who volunteered for the army, they had seen things, the likes, the savagery, they saw the concentration camps, millions of dead Jews, the firebombing, the result of the atomic bombs. And so they came back and they drank a lot of liquor to try to forget. And they didn't want to make the simple kind of movies they'd been making before. People like John Ford and William Wyler did not want to make, they had to make a statement. There's a great documentary. I would love you guys to watch it. I'll show some preview to it. It's called Five Who Came Back. Five major Hollywood directors quit their day jobs and joined the Army. Most of them were too old to be combat soldiers. They're in their 40s to 60s. John Ford was one of them. Uh, um, John Houston was probably the youngest one who had written 
uh, Maltese Falcon. Uh, they had successful careers. Frank Capra, who had directed some of the most successful movies of the 1930s. It happened one night. Mr. Deeds goes to Washington. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Um, he had won the Academy Award, John Ford, Academy Award winner. And they gave up their careers, and they joined the military, and they joined, they formed a cinema group that was given the job of filming the war in the Pacific and in, in um, Europe. The footage we have of the war, and perhaps you've seen this stuff in documentaries throughout your life, was all filmed by cameramen with 16 millimeter camera. And a lot of them got killed doing it. Uh, John Ford filmed The Battle of Midway. It's a documentary. He and kamikaze pilots were crashing into his the, the, the boats. He was wounded and given a purple heart with some shrapnel that came off from one of those kamikaze pilots in the Europe, the invasion of D-Day, which was the big invasion. If you've seen Private Ryan, you know what I'm talking about. It was when we finally invaded Europe to fight Hitler. And more of our guys were lost on that day, day than ever before. It was carnage of the highest order. And these cameramen were filming the film, the the uh, the scenario. Lots and lots of the cameras were lost because the guys were shot and killed themselves, and the cameras ended up on the bottom of the ocean. Some of a lot of it survived, and that's the footage we've seen over the years. Perhaps you've seen that some of that footage. Um, and the movie Saving Private Ryan and other movies. The longest day is another one. Use that scenario and that footage to tell their stories. These directors came back. They no longer wanted to make simple entertainment. They told the studios, I can't make this kind of movies anymore, but I'll make a movie if you let me have free reign. The movie studios are scared because they always want to have happy movies and happy endings. Uh, and so John Ford's first movie was called They Were Expendable, about the early days of World War II. And when we were not winning the war, uh, and it was not a happy ending. It was, he showed the carnage of the early days of the Pacific War. Uh, and it had a hopeful ending because by then the war was over and we know how it ends, folks. But we don't know yet. When he was making the film, we know it. When it was screened for the public, the war was over. But he's depicting it before the war was over when we were losing. And yes, we were losing the war big time in the Pacific. When we Father came back and did the Diary of Anne Frank as his another film that he made. Before that, he made Best Years of Our Lives, which is a coming home movie of three veterans coming home from World War I and trying to adjust to civil, uh, uh, civilian life. And it wasn't easy. And he showed it in a really realistic way. One of the characters has had his arms blown off um, it wasn't an easy transition to come back into civilian life. And that film depicted it in a very realistic way. It won all sorts of Academy Awards for directing and acting. Frank Capra made um, his his perennial Christmas movie. Uh, now it is. It wasn't then. Um, hmm. Why am I forgetting the title? We all watch it every Christmas with James Stewart, Donna Reed. Uh, about a guy, James Stewart, who is trying to commit suicide. 
on Christmas because he felt that he hasn't led a meaningful life and nobody knows or cares who he is. An angel comes down from heaven and shows him what his life would be like, the town would be like without him. And when it first came out, James, James Stewart had fought in World War II as a pilot. This is his first movie. And he thought when he made this movie, his career was going to be over. So did Frank Capra. But this is the movie he needed to make. Why can't I think of the name of this movie? It's so ridiculous. This is so popular. Um... I'm looking it up right now as I talk to you guys because it's frustrating. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to come up with it one second here. Come on. So ridiculous. I'm going to pause it just for one second. Oh, okay, I got it. It's a wonderful life. Um, <clears throat> now it's become a perennial Christmas movie that makes us all feel that we have a worthy life and that we would be missed. Realistic, humanistic story based on their experience of World War II. In Europe, Italians, Hitler... Then they became our ally because they gave up on Hitler. And their filmmakers made two films that changed, referred to it as Italian neorealism. That means the new realism. The Bicycle Thieves, the Victoria de Sica, and open, Rome Open City by Roberto Rossellini. These, for the most part, by budget. These aren't Hollywood films, folks. And for the most part, Bicycle Thieves is filmed with amateur actors and it's filmed on the streets of been war torn. People are in poverty. There's no jobs. People are hungry. How did these civilians survive the war? And this one, he doesn't have a job. But man, nobody had cars. There was no night day. It's the movie. He's looking for his bike. That's how simplistic the story is. That's what his survival has been. End of this, but this way he do he still like that's why it's called bicycle feet. But he's caught by the way, and they they figured out what dad was. They don't put him in jail. Still have to live with the shame of the dad being a bicycle. It's actually, footage of the Germans patrolling the streets. The real Germans put well, cameras to film them. Then they made this fictitious story because there's death. There's great hope at the end because the children are, because the children are going to survive and their future. These film audiences who can see those in big cities, foreign films that later. And to called film noir, black earth games, more human. And so a whole new genre popped up called film noir, black film. And criminals and the women of the night seduced. By a really beautiful woman into murdering some rich husband, ring twice by a film noir. He's the dupe who will do. Anything um, that was classic film noir, film noir, a lot of the people, the men were 